good, good afternoon, good morning, and good evening uh, to all our panelists, distinguished panelists and attendants, participants in this panel, which is part of the International Law Weekend of the annual meeting of the American branch of the International Law Association. Uh, the panel is devoted to a subject which is a, a broad one and a very uh, relevant in our current situation, reinvesting in the foundations of public international law. I will be moderating the panel and then inviting you to participate in the Q&A uh, section. As uh, you may have seen, the panel will be dealing with factors that shape the legal scenario. Those are factors that are uh, not only legal ones, but also economic and political and social ones. A universal health crisis, a very significant economic crisis, and shifts in assumptions underpinning the post war uh, legal order, which is an all encompassing title to, to see that everything seems to be moving ahead or moving backwards, but everything is also in motion. We all know that the foundational concepts of international legal order are subject to a relentless evaluation. Inspirational values are enshrined in the UN Charter, in human rights, global and regional conventions, in economic and commercial legal disciplines, in environmental codes, and in several multilateral conventions with almost universal reach. And of course, their related customary norms. But they do not depict the ways and means by which these concepts and values become effective and influence events and social behavior. This roundtable proposes to take a broad perspective on sources, state responsibility, and dispute settlement. These themes will be introduced by leading jurists, uh, academics, and practitioners who play in their own dimension, key roles in the analysis of the international system and its functioning. Principles and norms, institutions, procedures, provide a wide picture of an active international law in constant search of effectiveness and legitimacy. Challenges to the legal order, which are always present in our society, become more stressful when paradigms change altogether with perceptions on the content of universalism and the way its conception is built. We all know that there are queries, both in terms of focus and relevance of the existence, existing norms and rules, and that in evolving scenarios, there is a constant demand for a better understanding and even a review of the underlying trends and forces fostering the changes and adaptations. I'm pleased to introduce our panelists. I will introduce uh, all of them to, uh, together, one after the other, and then I will give the floor to the first speaker who will be Professor Patricia galbao -Teles. Patricia, uh, Professor Patricia galbao -Teles is Professor of International Law of the Autonomous University of Lisbon, member of the United Nations International Law Commission, and co-chair of the International Law Commission's study group on sea level rise in relation to international law. He's also co-director of the Singapore CILE Academy uh, of uh, International Law. She's a senior legal consultant on international law at the legal department of the Portuguese Ministry of Foreign Affairs and a member of the Permanent Court of Arbitration. Professor Galvao Teles will introduce treaties as a foundational source, as well as its current situation in lawmaking and the wide presence of soft law mechanisms and agreements. Then, Professor Anthony Angi, who teaches at the S.J. Queenie School of Law, University of Utah, and at the National University of Singapore. He's also head of the unit on teaching and researching international law in Asia at the Center for International Law in Singapore and a member of the Third World Approaches to International Law to Aid Network of Scholars. He's co-editor of the Asian Journal of International Law and will be addressing customary law as one of the pillars of international law. And he will be uh, raising the question, is law to be reinvented? 
invented in this respect. Dr. Martins Papadinskis is Associate Professor in Public International Law at the University College London. He's a member of the Permanent Court of Arbitration. He is an OSC Court of Conciliation Arbitration member and, and a member also of the Implementation Committee of the Water Convention. Martins has also been co-nominated by Latvia, Estonia, and Lithuania for election to the International Law Commission. We cross our fingers, Martins. Professor Paparistis will talk about state responsibility and tendencies regarding compensation and reparation. And finally, Dr. Mamadou Ebie, Associate Professor of International Law at the Grotius Center for International Legal Studies, Leiden University. Before joining the uni this university, he was special assistant to the former president of the International Court of Justice, His Ex Excellency Judge Abdulkawi A. Yusuf. Professor Ebie will address issues related to dispute settlement and the role of existing means through the experience of political and jurisdictional instruments. Perhaps the uh, forthcoming anniversary of the Manila Declaration will provide very uh, good food for your analysis. Each speaker will have five to seven minutes uh, to uh, address and to refer to the main uh, topics uh, in each uh, subject. And there will be a second round of interventions if they, uh, uh, they so uh, will have to do. Uh, to have. So I will invite our panelists uh, commencing by uh, Patricia to uh, refer to uh, refer to the question of uh, uh, treaties and soft law and according to your own views. You have your time, Patricia. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Maria Teresa. It's a pleasure to see all the members of this panel, uh, although we're in different places of the world uh, and only virtually. Um, some of us are actually in New York and have been uh, uh, meeting uh, on, on a normal physical basis, and that's the case of Martins and myself. Uh, but I'm, I want to say first that how grateful I am um, for Abila to have again put this together, this uh, excellent International Law Weekend. It's now a long-standing tradition. The past two years we've been online. Hopefully next year we'll be able to meet in person, and I want to thank uh, uh, Leila Sadat and her team uh, again for an excellent organization. Um, I, I'm going to start um, by uh, making, as you said, Maria Teresa, a few considerations uh, on how um, treaties um, are still um, an important uh, foundational source, an important concept, an important part of international law. Um, how, however, we've seen um, in past years, uh, there's a certain stagnation. I've been calling it stagnation. I've had discussions with other colleagues that prefer to call it inertia. Um, or loss of appetite, uh, but I think I'll go for the stronger word of stagnation. And then how that has prompted um, uh, soft law uh, and other um, non-traditional sources to have uh, taken up a bit of the, um, of the floor that was uh, usually occupied by treaties. Um, and, and I will conclude by making a plea that uh, treaties are still um, viable and we should still reinvest in treaties as a foundational source of international law. Um, so my first point about how treaties are still a foundational concept and a, fund a fundamental source of international law um, and why it is still a relevant um, instrument uh, for states to address the issues that they have to address, um, including, um, uh, as it was said um, in uh, the um, concept note for this panel, um, crisis, important crises that are going on, uh, including the pandemic crisis, um, the climate crisis, and, and other crises. So uh, treaties are still, and we were just uh, having a small chat about this. I mean, there's still, when you look at statutes of international courts and tribunals, they come number one. And um, they come number one, number one, not because they are the oldest source, and Tony will be talking about customer international law, but, but because they are the ones that are closer to states in the sense that, uh, you know, they're voluntary agreements, uh, they're negotiated uh, by states, they are focused on the issue they want to address, and also because they are in writing, and they are in writing, and you have also, you know, ratifications of voluntary commitment. So it, it's probably the easiest uh, one to apply, and, and it comes very natural 
um, as a first source in any statute of international courts and tribunals. And I suppose in you know bilateral relationships, um, this is also what states look at. So also in the first instance, is if there's an issue, if there's a dispute, um, uh, is there a treaty that provides an answer um, on um, uh, international law for a certain issue? So it, it is still, I mean, it's still a useful um, uh, instrument. Uh, it has um, fulfilled very important functions. I mean, we have we have the current international legal order uh, based on the, the Charter of the United Nations, and and we have most areas of international law based on on treaty law, and and it's uh, indeed now I think especially in the last five seven years that we've seen this m movement towards a more um, uh, stagnation. Uh, phases where state seems to have lost their appetite for big multilateral treaties. I'm not going to comment on uh, um, bilateral treaties because I think they are still, uh, that part is still very alive and, and states are still doing and probably more than ever uh, bilateral treaties. But at the big picture level, at the multi multilateral level, um, maybe I would say uh, there, there have been others, uh, other agreements in the meantime, but perhaps the last moment where states came together and negotiate at a major international agreement was the Paris Agreement in 2015. And actually it's quite uh, notable that it was the agreement that was signed by more states uh, in the very same day uh, in the history um, of treaty making. So after Paris, after 2015, it seems like, um, and it, this has to do, of course, I'm not gonna go into that uh, with um, um, a political atmosphere that is not very conducive uh, to um, advancing international agenda on major issues. And, and so we've seen this, uh, this period where it's difficult in many of the treaties that are um, potentially in the agenda of the Sixth Committee, for example, um, they've been uh, there for a while. We have uh, the famous articles on state responsibility that are uh, very uh, much um, in the radar of states, but they stay in the, in the Sixth Committee. Uh, we've we've had um, you know other attempts um, of uh, pushing forward um, other treaties also in the sixth committee and there seems to be no no appetite. So we have now a bit of a period where um, uh, there's a stagnation after the boom uh, of the 20th century. Um, if we look statistically, uh, probably certainly after 1945, um, we had an incredible boom in terms of uh, treaty making. Most treaties that uh, are foundational for today's international uh, legal order, they've been negotiated after the creation of the UN and in the past 70 years. Uh, but now we, we're a, a bit on hold uh, due to political reasons, certainly. Um, and this has uh, generated a parallel movement, which in some ways I think it's healthy and, it, and it's interesting and, and, and it helps. But then at the same time, uh, I think states should also realize uh, that although it's not lawmaking per se, uh, but there are um, uh, non-traditional sources, soft law um, uh, emerging uh, also outside the hands or, or not necessarily still completely in the hands of states or international organizations because we have a plurality of actors like academia and academic institutions, learned societies, the International Law Commission also that comes into that picture. Um, of um, um, a, a way, an alternative, an alternative way to advancing the international uh, legal agenda by setting standards um, in diverse uh, issues uh, through uh, soft codification, soft law. And it's a welcome development, I would say, because, I mean, uh, we don't stop and, and people are still thinking about developing rules for addressing important issues. But at the same time, um, I would uh, think that states should also be a bit concerned uh, for having international law going a bit outside of their hands. And, and it, it's interesting sometimes uh, to see then when a dispute comes, um, how these uh, other instruments are, are valid. So I would still with this, uh, and I know my time is up and I want to hear uh, the reactions of colleagues. Um, I would make this uh, plea, as I said, um, for not abandoning treaties. I'm, I'm here as the, <laughs> the advocate for treaty, uh, treaty making, uh, because I think they are a very um, important source. Um, it's how we shape, and especially how states and international organizations uh, uh, shape the development of international law. It's how uh, the international community can more effectively also respond to crises 
And sometimes we have the idea that treaty making can be slow, uh, but if there's political will, it can also be very uh, quick. And probably one of the best examples were the Geneva Conventions after the Second World War that were negotiated in just a couple of months. And so it all depends on, on the political will. And so I think there are interesting um, processes going on now, for example, the BBNJ, an agreement for protection the, protecting the biodiversity in areas beyond national jurisdiction. It's probably the major uh, effort that is going on in treaty making, uh, but there's also a process uh, going on in Geneva for a possible pandemics treaty. And I think it would be very important um, uh, to seize this moment where it's a moment of crisis and, and international law is essentially crisis different, uh, driven and, and responsive to crisis. Uh, for example, on pandemics, BBNJ, uh, we think that also there's a um, crimes against humanity um, draft that the commission has prepared and the sixth committee seems to be uh, giving some positive signs. So perhaps uh, the stagnation is slowly evolving back to activity. So I'll stop here and I, I'm very grateful uh, for your attention. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Gavaltelis. And I will invite uh, Professor Angie to uh, address the question of customary law and its mysteries. Uh, so, uh, sorry, uh, uh, I was wondering whether uh, we uh, make some comments on Patricia's presentation uh, first. Well, if you want to comment, uh, feel free. Or, at, oh. or go to your subjects and then comment. That would be up to you. Everything is welcome. Thank you. <laughs> uh, okay. Um, uh, so, um, uh, so then uh, let me just say a few things about customer international law, but also based uh, following on on uh, Patricia's uh, wonderful presentation. But first, uh, let me thank uh, the organizers uh, of this uh, uh, of this great event. Uh, it is. Um, particularly important to, uh, to rethink international law in these sorts of circumstances. The one thing I would say is uh, my, uh, my overview about this situation is that it, to me, it seems that we need not so much a reinvestment in international law so much as the reinvention of international law. I think we need a different approach uh, from the one that we've taken so far. Because uh, if we reinvest in the foundations of international law, we're going to reinvest in sovereignty. Sovereignty is the foundation of international law. And it seems to me that uh, tying this in with what Patricia has said, it seems to me that we are living in a particularly divided world at this point of time. And in these circumstances, uh, you know, sovereign states are taking uh, positions which are in their own interest in the short term, but uh, which don't necessarily you could say advance the well-being of mankind. So um, I, was I was going to say that um, I completely agree with uh, Patricia that treaties are fundamentally important. You know, we are still governed by the United Nations Charter. Um, and uh, in terms of her, your presentation, Patricia, what interested me is that we see, I quite agree with you, that we don't have the large scale treaties that we witnessed even in the 1990s, you know, the WTO or the International Criminal Court. Um, and yet all these crises have taken place. Uh, what is interesting about treaty making, it seems to me is that we do have uh, some important regional treaties. So in Asia, we have the regional, the, uh, the treaty, the ASEP, which uh, came into existence and which creates this, you know, uh, this large trading bloc. Uh, we might also think of the treaty on the prohibition of nuclear weapons. And uh, that's a treaty that is almost a treaty created in defiance, expressing a kind of division uh, rather than anything else. Uh, so there are these interesting examples of treaties that are coming to existence, but they suggest a divided world rather than a world in which there is a un uniform set of rules that are perhaps needed in these circumstances. So it is in that context that you know customary international law still is extremely itself in many, in many ways the bedrock of the whole system, um, the customer international law relating to sovereignty and so forth. Ideally, customer international law would be a vehicle by which a global order that seems to meet the requirements or the needs of all mankind can be established. But of course, customer international law itself is very much based on sovereign consent or some version of it. Uh, so uh, what interests me in these circumstances is this sort of disjunction between a situ situation where there is a crisis 
but we don't have the treaty making mechanisms that would that would at this point of time address those crises as patricia said you know international law can be seen as being driven by crisis you know every major international global regime has followed a great war but it's unclear to me as to whether for example the pandemic will result in a global regime that will create meaningful obligations now it's interesting even the paris agreement is a sort of treaty which provides so much discretion to the individual states that uh, it's a treaty making of a different kind i would suggest than a classic treaty which creates you know uh, clear obligations as it were um so you know um as uh, i come from a, a network of scholars called third world approaches to international law so given all these circumstances you know what interests me is uh, all these developments viewed from what might be broadly uh, perhaps wrongly thought of as a, a kind of third world tradition so here what interests me is the way in which in the midst of all these uncertainties an effort is made is being made in different particular regimes to establish customary international law. So I'm really interested, for example, in the way in which you know, doctrines relating to the war on terror, doctrines relating to unable and unwilling, doctrine, doctrines relating to you know, when can force be used, can force be used in response to emerging threats. And it's fascinating in that context for me to see the way in which you know, powerful states continue to try and create their own version of customary international law. Uh, you know, Sir, Sir Daniel Bethlehem wrote a very interesting piece in the American Journal of International Law relating to unable and unwilling and a number of other issues. And what fascinated me was the way in which his arguments were taken up by, uh, you know, um, by Australia, uh, by the United Kingdom and so forth. And the claim was being made, yes, you know, this is customary international law. So Daniel was very careful to say this is raising a number of controversial issues. But then it was taken up by these powerful states, which then said, well, and reading the different <clears throat> versions of this, you came to a point where the argument was made, well, now these are the principles that we see ourselves as you know, compelling customer international law for our purposes. Another area, and Martins can speak to this with far more expertise, is the whole issue about customer international law in foreign investment. And here you know, we have something like, I, I think it's Article 5 or Article 6 in the uh, Model US Bilateral Investment Treaty, which makes a you know, an explicit reference in the treaty to customary international law. And that brings in a whole set of uh, principles that developing countries didn't really pay much attention to or have much role in participating. So I just wanted to, do, I think my time is up, I just wanted to sort of try to connect my presentation with Patricia's and make some additional comments about customary international law. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you very much. I think uh, you have already put some uh, uh, themes uh, on the agenda of our meeting, we will have a lot to discuss afterwards. The generalization of this uh, the, the, the divisions and uh, divided views regarding the content and scope of the treaty. And now we go uh, to the responsibility, which is a subject that will be introduced by uh, Dr. Paparistis, and to your time, uh, Professor. Uh, many thanks, Madam Chair, and it's. Uh... May I add my voice to the to the thanks already expressed to the to the organizers who have so ably uh, set up this very traditional institution for the very unusual times. It is a privilege to be here and humbling to be in such an audience. Um, I think that it's I'm in a situation where I think my 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 brain is literally fuzzing with all the excitement of things that I have already heard. But let me try to focus more on things that I should actually be talking about. Uh, I think I want to make uh, sort of three points, starting from the more general to the more specific one. And my sort of the, the bigger point is that I think that in state responsibility, the basic intellectual tension underpinning the field nowadays, as well as I think in the post Second World War era, is a tension between bilateralism and multilateralism, both expressing important truth uh, about the character of the international legal order, both reflecting important interests, but striking the balance in a slightly different way. And that is, of course, is not a terribly original point. It has been made differently over the years by sort of the great figures, Mario Spinetti, Robert Tiago, Bruno Sima, Giorgio Gaia, and of course, the late and much missed um, Judge Crawford. But that is really sort of the point that runs uh, through the 
the international law commissions work on the issue as well. Uh, is it only the uh, injured actors uh, that can invoke responsibility or other, other states as well? Is there anything beyond the normal private law type modal rules on reparation or is there aggravated responsibility? Or to use perhaps the somewhat inelegant phrase of Article 54, are states uh, that are not formally injured in life are entitled to take measures that are to some extent analogous to countermeasures. So that I think is really sort of the interesting theme and tension and one can see it both in the practice of judicial institutions and also in uh, state practice, I think really something that is really sort of bubbling beneath the terrain of six committee submissions every uh, three years. And I think a very interesting question is whether the broader balance struck um, on the point by International Law Commission 20 years ago might be affected in any way by the state practice emanating from uh, the uh, pandemic crisis. And I uh, penned, a, penned last year a short uh, piece in the American Journal of International Law where I sort of phrase it as a, as a hypothetical question, whether this unique type of challenge, uh, I think uh, Maurice Mandelson once hypothesized the idea of instant custom would only arise if we were invaded by aliens and everybody was facing the same challenge. So. I think that pandemic is perhaps the closest that one gets to the Independence Day in this reality. Whether that is going to create to some extent uh, commonalities in response and whether uh, states, uh, when they convene uh, next year in the Sixth Committee, to reflect on articles on state responsibility and their future role might say something. So that is something to look forward to. I have said I've been struck again by the well, I suppose really the wisdom of the balance that was struck 20 years ago, that mostly states managed to articulate their very different views within the broader framework. So that was my first point. The second and third points I will make more briefly. And my second point is I think that, uh, as Madam Chair indicated in the introduction, I think that the most exciting things in law of state responsibility are happening in the place that used to be the backwater. Uh, second part. Uh, content of state responsibility. And if we look at things that people were excited about in 80s and 90s, people were excited about international crimes, uh, countermeasures, uh, circumstances precluding wrongfulness. Uh, I mean, I think I'm obviously painting with a broad brush, but one sometimes gets a sense that perhaps it's really too unbearably vulgar to talk about money. Uh, these are not really things that international law is about. And now, if we look at the Secretary General's uh, triannual compendium, I think that with every year they, of course, there's a lot of stuff of attribution, but with every year there's more and more coming out on really the, where the lawyer's law on compensation, causality, contribution to injury, mitigation, and such things. And again, uh, in International Tribunal for Law of the Sea, International Court of Justice, uh, we have currently the great pending uh, Congo and Uganda case, international law is sort of becoming interested in such vulgar things as remedies. And that is also sort of the, the related interesting point that that is not really something that had the great intellectual pedigrees elaboration of rules on attribution, for example, you know, done extremely thoroughly by Roberto Ago and then redone extremely thoroughly by uh, Judge Crawford. This was really Reparation came in a bit sideways, a little bit oddly by Roberto Riphagen, then picked up by um, uh, Arangio Ruiz and then redone, but again, very thoroughly, of course, in a typically Judge Crawford-esque manner, but probably not as something that people were hugely excited about. So I think that this is just so very interesting. It tells us a lot about state responsibility. It also tells us, I think, a lot about the influence of uh, the International Law Commission's work on the international lawmaking process and the reception by endorsement or by lack of criticism by states. I think that that's something that the 2018 ILC conclusions on custom sort of allude to ILC's own influence on custom in that way. And final point, I think, um, in the 30 seconds remaining, I think just to flag uh, that the case that I mentioned in the ICJ, the Congo, Uganda, uh, I think is absolutely going to be transformative and provide a point of departure uh, for the discussion of uh, law of reparation 
an extremely complicated case uh, on uh, causality, concurrency, mitigation, and so on. So in a way, the focal point of international uh, law will be moving from Eastern Europe or factory of Chorzo uh, to the Great Lakes region, and nothing wrong with that at all. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you very much, and, and thank you for introducing the word transformative in the sense that decisions of a tribunal can have this uh, uh, effect and consequence. Now it's a pleasure to give the floor to uh, Professor and Dr. Ebier, who will be addressing dispute settlement and your time is available. Yes. Thank you very much, uh, Chair. Thank you very much to all the organizers for the hard work and for making this uh, meeting possible. So I'm tasked with discussing uh, dispute settlement mechanisms and whether they are up to the task of settling the dispute and crisis that are uh, arising nowadays. And I will give a simple answer, which is yes. Uh, the dispute settlement mechanism that we have are uh, good enough to be able to face all the challenges and crises uh, that we are giving. Why is it so? It is so first because of the great flexibility of legal dispute settlement mechanism. Legal dispute settlement, uh, no, of the great flexibility of political dispute settlement mechanism. Political dispute settlement mechanisms such as diplomacy can settle almost every kind of dispute. The parties need just to agree on the procedure and agree on the outcome and the dispute is settled. As far as legal dispute settlement mechanisms are concerned, such as tribunals and courts, there are also uh, tribunals and courts have had a century of experience dealing with disputes. So since 1920, when the statute of the PCIJ was being drafted and adopted to nowadays, it's almost 100 century and during 100 years. And during that period, they have developed skills, techniques to deal with how do we determine the applicable law? What are the relevant facts? What is a fair procedure in order to hear both parties? Even some technical areas uh, of law that have arisen recently could be addressed using experts. So really tribunals also are well equipped to deal with, uh, with the disputes and the crisis that we have nowadays. I should even say that international law is more denser, is more complete than it was in the early 1920s or uh, in 1945. And uh, the rules are to a certain extent, at least to their, at their nucleus, clear and accepted by the large majority of the international community uh, when that was not the case in the 70s and the 80s. So after this simple answer, let's now look at the real problems. The real problems is in the way that the principle, in my view, are articulated. The first principle of uh, dispute settlement is the freedom of choice. The parties are free to choose their means of dispute settlement. But what are we seeing in practice? They are using diplomatic means for long period of time without getting closer to a dispute. There are certain disputes that have been existing for more than a century without any solution. And what this is leading to is an increase in the number of disputes, which could lead to greater crisis in the, in the future. So for this problem, what I would propose is really to rethink the articulation between political dispute settlement mechanism and legal dispute settlement mechanism. When a dispute cannot be solved by diplomacy, the parties should have the courage to take it to the court, at least for the court to address the legal side of the dispute. The political one could be, uh, the settlement through political means could be facilitated by the intervention of uh, tribunals. The second uh, principle that I want to propose, it doesn't exist at the moment because I think that dispute management to, should lead to a greater humanization of international law. If the Security, Security Council adopt sanctions, 
there will be automatically a humanitarian exception within the measures adopted by the Security Council. When the dispute goes to a court, a tribunal is uh, able to order provisional measures in order to protect humanitarian uh, consideration and human right pending the settlement of the dispute. What I'm thinking about is that in 2021, it is still unfair that states are fighting their battles using human suffering as scores. What I mean by that, we have seen a recently dispute where uh, students were not allowed to register. We have seen sanctions that have completely crippled economies and, uh, and, uh, yes, and people's life. So what I'm thinking is simply that we should add another principle in our dispute settlement mechanism, which is that the parties should take all measures to ensure that there are, the measures that they take will not unduly affect uh, uh, human rights uh, during uh, human rights pending the settlement of their of their dispute. I think that this would be a, an extra step. I know, but I think that it's a good step that we need to take it. If we took it in humanitarian law, we imposed it on the Security Council. We take it in uh, uh, during in provisional measures. We could probably think about taking it uh, more generally. So the 40th anniversary of the Manila Declaration could be really an opportunity to reaffirm the two principles that I just mentioned. But I would now focus just on uh, legal dispute settlement uh, means. I think that we have to be very careful. There is a next uh, a great excite excitement be, uh, towards legal dispute settlement mechanisms, courts and tribunal. We know that there are cultures where those dispute settlement mechanisms are not privileged. That's one aspect. But we have to think not only about the efficiency of the tribunals or the court, but think in general about the fairness of the system that the tribunal is implementing and enforcing. Why am I saying that? I think that when a tribunal, when you have a very efficient legal dispute settlement mechanism to enforce an unfair and inequitable system, the dangers are quite high. And that's where I want to draw the attention to all the debates and uh, discussions that we are having about reforming investment law, reforming the WTO law, the WTO not to think just about dispute settlement mechanism as an end in themselves, but we have to think about the rules, the substantive rules themselves. And I say that coming from uh, Burkina Faso and Africa in general, where the view, at least from my perspective, is that our interests are not currently fully taken care in the international uh, economic law and should, they should be more protected. Finally, and that's my last point, I know that my time is almost up. I would say there are areas of international law that have not been yet uh, multilateralized. And I will just single uh, one of such areas, and that's uh, international financial law. No one there is talking about it, but uh, all those who feel uh, that Iranian sanctions are particularly unfair should be thinking about how can we get the system multilateralized so that one country, one state is not able to completely cripple uh, an entire economy. Of course, it's good to rely on, on benevolence, but we understand that there will always be a moment when uh, there will be a leader that won't be that benevolent as others. And we still also have to consider whether it makes sense that the sovereign debt litigation of uh, developing countries are decided in only two or three main uh, jurisdictions, New York, London, and Paris. Because of the nature of, those, of this litigation, I think that probably the field also deserves uh, multilateralization in order to reduce the, its negative uh, consequences. So, I'm closing on multilateralization, which is bringing us to treaties. So, and I wait. I will. I will wait. Patricia, my comments will be coming later.
。そうね。<笑>はい。Because the period when multilateralization was really effective, it was in the 1970s and 1980s, and it was、uh, due to the fact that developing countries wanted to update the content of customary international law. So I'm coming to Anthony,、uh, to Tony, and wanted to make sure that the rules reflected more their interests. But what I see seems to be a disengagement by developing countries. From、uh, multilater multilateralization, and I was wondering what are your views on this point? Would you like Patricia or Professor Anki or Mark? Both, both of them. <laughs> <laughs> cool. I, I, you are invited I, I, to participate. I, I will just make a couple of remarks because I think many of the points that were made、uh, by all the speakers are, are very, very connected. Um, and I think that、um, maybe I can sum up with a, with a provocative、um, uh, approach in, in the sense, and I think this has to do with what、uh, Mamadou just said.、Um, you know, is, is it the fact? I mean, you can also think that there's a disinvestment in treaties because big powers don't want more rules. I think you can also make that argument, but、mm -hmm. I can also see the argument that you're making that it's.、Uh, Um, uh, the, uh, the developing world is not interested because,、uh, or is no longer interested because there was already that update, update post uh, uh, independence, post、uh, self determination and decolonization.、Um, but I think there's an, another point that,、uh, on what was Tony saying, I mean, and this issue about the relationship between treaties and custom、um, is, is、uh, fascinating. In, in the sense that I think international law really evolves by the interaction of the sources. We can really take、um, a separate approach to the sources. And I, and I think this, this interaction between treaty and, and, and custom is, is extremely important. And, and custom has certainly not lost its role、um, in that sense. And if you look at、uh, what international courts and tribunals do,、um, although it's source number two in the statute of the ACJ, it's, it's one that it's there for when. You know,、uh, state is not party to a treaty or the treaty is not yet in force. And so it's, it's、uh, or there's no rule、um, in terms of a, of a treaty.、Uh, but I, from what Mamadou said and what、um, Tony said, and also、uh, the reflections of Martins about、um, state responsibility, which I think it's, it's really a good example of what I'm going to say is,、um, you know, maybe one of the questions、um, is. What is the source、um, that is more inclusive and democratic、um, in the sense of, of custom or treaties? Um, and, and it seems that I think we can argue, um, and you know, examples like UNCLOS, for example,、um, certainly if it wasn't done by treaty, maybe the rules on the law of the sea would look very differently if it wasn't done by treaty. And the points that uh, Enge, uh, Anthony Enge was making about the development of、uh, you know, rules on combating terrorism and the use of force,、um, the custom is really developing、uh, by、um, the practice of certain states and not necessarily all states. And, and, and custom has to be a generalized practice. And that's very hard to say. And、uh, what, what is that generalized practice and how do we assess it? And, and looking at it from the point of view of、uh, The, the International Law Commission, for example, I mean, when we try to see 
uh, what is the state practice and opinion juries, the sources available uh, are very limited and they're limited to certain countries and certain languages. And um, so that's also an issue. That's why, although I, I, I'm not here to <laughs> sell <laughs> the viability and the importance of treaties in that sense, but, uh, but I, I think it's something that we have to reinvest, uh, you know, talking to the team of the panel and the, the conference, uh, reinvest in treaties, uh, because I think in a sense, they are more inclusive they produce also a law that is more clear and readily available. And, and this all, I mean, this is a discussion that we've had for a number of years, 20 years now, and will continue to have on precisely on the example of state responsibility, whether it would be better to have a treaty or just leave the articles uh, in this uh, um, form um, that mostly I mean, um, they are seen as uh, the, uh, reflecting customer international law. So this is what I launch, I mean, trying to pick up on the different points that were and may then reacting to them. Thank you very much, Patricia. Would uh, uh, any other panelists who would like to comment on this or we go to the questions? I'm in your hands. Questions? Very good. Um, uh, 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 yes. <laughs> If I could just follow up very briefly, and I and I think, um, uh, and I think so. Pat Pat Patricia already, in in a way, made the point that it's. I mean, perhaps we um, one usually, you know, the grass is always greener on the other side, uh, and uh, of course there are many things in play. Uh, perhaps for a generalist legal mind, uh, the framing between different sources is analytically helpful one. Uh, for actors in the lawmaking process, those could be the institution through which they articulate the rules, as uh, well as uh, uh, the uh, substance of the particular rules. And I think that it's, you know, it is fair to say that uh, Law of the Sea is an excellent example. If you know, if, if if your state can send an aviation carrier to the Black Sea and try to uh, run it on the fourth mile line uh, to enforce a legal point, uh, it is easier to make custom in the particular issue or every persistent objector than if you don't have a spare aviation carrier to send around the world. Uh, but you know, equally, uh, if you can send a large legal team uh, to a faraway country. Uh, to elaborate a very complicated technical and scientific uh, treaty. It is easier if you have that capacity and you can then those people. So, I mean, you know, obviously there are socioeconomic realities uh, that uh, will not be uh, remedied or addressed uh, by choice of one or another source. Uh, and I think that the articles on state responsibility are interesting because in precisely that context, uh, the developing world has very much argued uh, for uh, convening a conference. And of course, there is uh, ground for reasonable disagreement uh, on that point. Uh, some people are more satisfied with the balanced drug than others, but I think it's that uh, that 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 strikes me as a bit of a sort of a, a, a counterexample, if I if I may. And that and I think that that probably raises sort of the bigger normative question that the Ultimately, if it is a policy choice uh, to do something or not to do something, uh, the choice not to do something, maybe also read charitably uh, as reflecting the great importance uh, of uh, international law on the issue and the unwillingness to rush uh, into it. So I think really the fact that international economic lawmaking has become much more complicated than it was in the 1990s. Uh, I wouldn't necessarily see that as a negative consideration. It is just reflects a much greater appreciation by the policymakers within states of the very, very significant and sometimes very immediate uh, legal and financial implications. So if something is important, it will be taken seriously. So that probably would be the most charitable way of looking at stagnation. Perhaps it's overthinking. Is uh, Anthony, would you like to react? Uh, uh, well, just uh, since Mamadou uh, explicitly raised this issue, um, so I, I appreciate those comments uh, because, um, you know, in terms of treaty making and the developing countries, I think we can see the different phases. I mean, you know, the, the great project of the law of the sea, um, 
And then, of course, the United States has reservations. Uh, then everything shifts in terms of uh, uh, the deep sea bed authority. Um, and you know, a, a lot of the optimism of developing countries in terms of what could be achieved uh, through treaties, I think, uh, has diminished. And the promise of the major multilateral treaties hasn't really been delivered to many developing countries. So if you think of the WTO, for example, you know, it's very interesting how the Western countries got all their issues included, you know, trips, gas. But when it came to things like agriculture and textiles, uh, none of these things were, you know, given the same um, uh, free trade uh, 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 rights that uh, the WTO generally guaranteed. And then, you know, the argument was, well, we will address all these issues in the Doha developing round. And the Doha developing round never really eventuated. If you think of the International Criminal Court, the other major event, I mean, you know, it's now notorious that uh, it seems the International Criminal Court uh, only focuses on, you know, um, a wrongdoing by the non-Western world in the non-Western world. You know, we can see the recent, uh, some of the developments about Afghanistan are somewhat uh, dismaying in that regard. Um, it's a huge issue, this whole question of what areas are covered by dispute resolution, what areas are not. If you think of the issue of debt, it is a massive issue. It is having a huge impact. You know, Africa continues to transfer resources to the rich world. If you look at the whole issue of debt payments, interest payments, you know, that continues to be the case. And it's fascinating to see how dispute settlement processes, like national courts, in, as Mamadou said, you know, in, can undo even debt structures using a combination of foreign investment law and, uh, you know, um, and, and so forth. So I think those are really important issues. In terms of Martins, uh, you know, this whole question about the shift to reparations and remedies, you know, isn't it fascinating to me? I think in, in, I think in the Congo-Uganda case, the claim is something like $4 billion, something like that. You know, well, to me, well, it's fast. 12. <laughs> okay. That's large. <laughs> uh, even larger than I thought. Um, you know, well, well, you know, but now we see, you know, investor state dispute settlement handing down awards for like, was it 50 billion or 60 billion in new costs? <laughs> I, I can't remember. I'm not sure what's happened to that. But we also see, you know, the recent case in Pakistan, $4 billion. $4 billion wipes out pretty much a health budget, an education budget. But the more important thing to me is, it seems to me that the law of state responsibility has been following these parallel tracks. I would say state responsibility has been developed in great detail, especially in relation to the issue of remedies and reparations by investment arbitration. You know, so we're looking to the Congo, Uganda to address something more about reparations, but all that has already been decided. There's a whole jurisprudence about it. There's a whole industry devoted to the whole question of calculating reparations. Huge amounts. Martins, you've done your, your, your wonderful work in terms of, you know, this whole question about the extent and scale and impact of those reparations. So to me, state responsibility was created for the, for the protection of corporations. If we look at the chores of factory case, I mean, that's the fundamental case about remedies, correct? It's about a corporation. So I would say, if you look at the history of it, it's all about a corporation. And our states are trying to catch up <laughs> with a system that is already in place. <laughs> and this is where issues of customer international law become important, because the issue is there are all these different theories about customer international law. But it seems to me that the one arena in which customer international law in however, however, however complicated and confused a way, continues to have an impact is in investment arbitration because we have people exercising extraordinary power, you know, uh, interpreting all these terms within these investment treaties dealing with customer international law, including foreign fair, fair and equitable treatment. I, I saw a question there. So let me stop there. Thanks. <laughs> yes, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Yes, there was exactly a question regarding the customary uh, uh, status of uh, the fair and equitable treatment, uh, so-called standard or principle. And uh, if you would like to address it further uh, on, uh, uh, welcome. I would like to uh, uh, recall a question regarding the role of uh, what I would say, academic enlightened institutions, international law association, Institut international, if they could do more 
uh, uh, to codify and progressively develop international law, including the response uh, to some of the major crises. And I would like to start by uh, asking this question to Martins and to Mamadou, if you would like to react. It is the role of non-governmental entities in prompting uh, developments of international law. If you, if you want to... Should I, want, should I go first, Martins? Yes, please. <laughs> okay, yes. good. Uh, two things about this question, because this question is based on the assumption that uh, some of the ongoing project of the ILC uh, are not receiving enough input and comments from state members. And I think that uh, the two questions have to be separated. It's not because uh, some of the ongoing projects are not receiving enough input and comments that we should give more role to, uh, to academic, to la société savante, as we, as we put it. I think that we really have to address the issue. Why aren't states commenting and providing their input on the ILC work? It's very, very important. And I think that the question that I raised is uh, to, that I addressed to Patricia and Tony was uh, going in that direction. I believe that developing countries and the G77 have to come back to uh, the table and try to give new life to the system. When they are not there, it's no longer exactly the same. And that's why I would say for me, that's one aspect. Now, what is the role of the of the academic bodies, such as the ILA or uh, the Institut de Droit International. I had the chance to observe the work of the Institut de Droit International on pandemics. And I think that one of their uh, greatest strength is the fact that they can go really quickly. And some of the challenges that we are facing, facing would require clarification of the norms and the progressive uh, suggestions on how to tackle certain crises. I think that Rapporteur Murase uh, completed his entire uh, resolution on the pandemics in less than a year. I don't think that the ILC would be able to do that. So that's something that we need to consider. And it means that instit uh, institutions such as uh, ILA and uh, Institute of Droit International have a great role uh, to play, but I would not put it or compare it with what the ILC, uh, what is the status of uh, the, the comments that states give or do not give to the workers of the ILC. I really think that we need to find ways to get the uh, developing countries and G77 back to the table. And uh, yeah, so much. Uh, well, thank you very much. Martin, would you like to supplement? Uh, Yes, although I think that I'm really in large agreement with Mamadou and just really trying to sort of to, to, to drag myself out of the mind of the conversations that I have had precisely on these topics, I imagine not I alone on the panel uh, over this week with the states. Uh, and I mean, that is that, you know, is the is the point if we look at six committee submissions over the last few decades, there would be states that intervene very rarely and there would be states who would have extremely thorough reports uh, every time. Now it could be that there are some topics that are not of interest to everybody, but I think that the timeline and sort of the legal resources point and you know the ability to prepare from late August to late October in parallel to high level leak and all the other committees uh, opinions on treaties, responsibility, atmosphere, a sea armed conflict and everything else in the world maybe something that not uh, all actors will have. So I think uh, I think one, I think halfway that I think it's uh, has been very um, inspiring, I think on, on the particular question of sea level rise is organization of submission through groups of states, uh, very much uh, you know, both uh, channeling expertise and also uh, strengthening uh, the voice and in a very practical sense, something that I, again, was, was very impressive to observe in person as those who speak first as representatives of group of states very much setting the tone for the debate. Um, so probably the only thing that I would like to add, I, I think it's, I'm, I'm not suggesting that Vlad's question was, was, was blind to the blurriness of boundaries, but of course, uh, 
uh, there is significant overlap in membership uh, between these bodies. The topics are also not clinically isolated. Customer international law, something that ILA worked on first, ILC afterwards, succession to state responsibility. The great Marcelo Cohen worked first, uh, and ILC is working currently. So I think that there's a sort of a, a bit of a messy thing. I, I don't know whether Madame Chair would permit me to say something about Tony's point about investment law. Um, uh, so um, I, I, I agree that most things that investment tribunals say about custom is really not much to write home about. But I think, uh, and so I really delight uh, criticizing that. But I think the bigger question is the one about institutions. And the termination of customer international law is something that I think my takeaway has been that it requires good institutional support. So if you put up a completely decentralized system with no quality expectations regarding knowledge of public international law, zero secretarial support. Uh, I mean, I, I mean, I wouldn't want to say that states get what they deserve. Obviously, I think some states get exactly what they want to get out of it. But I think that that sort of shows if we imagine if we wanted to get something that will be all over the place and of incredibly low quality, that is something roughly that we would be getting. Now, of course, the right answer is for the um, tribunals to refer to the work of uh, influential scholars. And um, I, I think I'm always very partial to tribunals that cite me. So I think that there is some uh, desirable movement in that direction in recent practice. Thank you very much. There is a question about foreign Maria, quick Ma treatment. Maria, Maria Teresa. Yes, please. No, can I still come back if you allow me to Vladislav's uh, question because I can resist first because it's Vladislav and I take the advantage to say hi, but also because I'm guilty of being ILC member, a member of the ILA, and also recently elected an uh, institute member together with my colleagues, Maria Teresa and, and, and Tony with who are much more experienced and can probably also uh, give their views on that. But I think I have to say, and this comes back to the point that I was making about the, um, you know, the um, if states don't occupy <laughs> the, um, the space in terms of lawmaking, um, others will um, in the sense, although they're not lawmakers, but they will and they feel compelled to do it. And, and I think it's also part of the process, it's healthy. I don't see this as bad competition. I see this as good competition. Even when we talk about uh, the ILC versus ILA and the Institut de Droit International, I think there's very important synergy, uh, but the roles are different and the constraints also in the work are different. Um, so um, I think it's very healthy that uh, you know, the Institut or the ILA goes first in a way uh, because there's a lot more freedom um, in the way that you approach, I mean, it's also exercise of codification and, and, and progressive development, but uh, uh, the, the, the constant interaction with states is not there. So I think they can be more progressive while there is in the way. And, and I think this, this synergy is, is healthy. And as um, Martin's mentioned, I mean, the uh, topic that I'm very involved in, because I'm one of the co-chairs of the study group on the ILC on sea level rise and international law, and I'm also a member of the committee of the ILA committee on this. Um, the fact that the ILA has started working on this um, has created a, a very significant synergy also with the ILC. Um, and and uh, with that, uh, there is already some very good work done. So the ILC is not starting from, from scratch. And so I, I see this, as I said, not as a negative competition, but as a very healthy uh, and positive uh, competition and, and, and also uh, good synergies. Um, the other point, and I think Mamadou was very right to say, these are separate questions. I mean, it's not the fact that it's the ILA or the Institute doing something that uh, drives states away from the ILC. I think many states would probably not even be so familiar uh, with the Institute's work or the ILA if the same topic was not the, on, on the ILC agenda. So the fact that we bring a topic to the ILC agenda that has been in the other institutions is also helpful for the visibility of the work of those institutions. And, and, uh, and I think the problem that was mentioned in, in, in the question 
about how to increase engagement and participation uh, is extremely relevant. And as Martin said, I mean, if I can say, we're both campaigning <laughs> for election, re-election to the ILC, and we have meetings with states. And what Martin has said is, is a recurrent topic, but I think we do need uh, to engage more states. But that has to do not only with capacity building um, and human resource availability and knowledge and expertise, uh, but I think it has to do also with the topics that the commission puts on the agenda. And, and the sea level rise topic has been, I think, an extremely important example of when you put a topic that is really of interest to everybody, and not theoretical, but very practical interest. Uh, we've had, as Martins was saying, um, the Pacific Island states, uh, the small island states um, from the Pacific, the Indian Ocean, the Caribbean, taking the floor. Um, Antigua was saying that, I mean, it's the first time that this states take the floor on the sixth committee, uh, because perhaps the other topics on the agenda, they were um, not as important and vital for them. So it has to do also with the choice of topics. I'll stop here. Thank you very much. It has been a very comprehensive analysis and uh, uh, very clear uh, explanation of uh, not only challenges, but also opportunities that international law is facing now. I was very struck by the idea that we should look at sanctions as part of a dispute settlement uh, setting in the sense that they could be uh, intruding or intervening in a, in, a, in, a, uh, uh, in a drive that should be taken up in a different setting and so on. Mamadou, would you like to say something now? Uh, quick comment, really, just on uh, the process of creation of customer international law, because it also ties up with Vlad's question as to if we define state practice, or if you consider the pro customer international law process, as a state practice and opinion juris, and we define state practice as what states actually do, then we will have areas where the developing countries will struggle to assert their voice because of technological or uh, financial conditions. But if we define customer international law from more a sociological perspective that has not been adopted by the ILC, there is more hope. There is more hope because their customary international law is primarily a social consensus. It is what the large majority of the community agrees upon. And it is not so much subject to the persistent objector rule to what we alluded. So I just wanted to flag that point because I, I understand that this approach to customary international law has lost at the ILC, but I still believe that it explains better the process of formation of rules. Yeah. Well, thank you very much. I don't know if we have more time. If you would like to address, there was a comment sent that through the Q&A uh, box saying, uh, referring to the effectiveness and respect for international law and an example of uh, a, a diplomat from uh, an African country who was uh, checked uh, when arriving uh, to the state to which he was posted because of the of a pandemic uh, 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 problem issue. And uh, this is a question that was addressed to Patricia, may, may, but maybe you already referred to this subject uh, during your, your own comments, uh, 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 comment, comment in time. Have you seen this, Patricia? Yes, now I'm looking at it. I mean, on, on the first part of the, the question about the effect, effectiveness of international law, this is a, something that, I mean, <laughs> for us, it's an, an, an existential question, <laughs> whether international law is effective or not, not. I mean, either when we're in the classroom, I'm sure <laughs> all of us are professors, we have this, <laughs> this discussion over and over. Um, but I, I think we only see uh, the tip of the iceberg. So we only see when international law doesn't work. Uh, we don't see it when it works and or we don't talk about it when it works. So I have a more positive uh, view on, on that sense that, okay, um, sure, uh, it doesn't work um, in important um, issues, um, but it does work in many other issues. And I think we have 
in uh, compared to 75 years ago, we have such a strong uh, basis and, and, and legal order that um, although sometimes uh, it's not respected and it's violated and even ignored or downplayed, um, international law still has a key role to play and, and we tend to see just the negative when it doesn't work. Um, on, on the point of uh, uh, the application, I don't want to go into the detail of, uh, of examples, but uh, um, I, I recently edited um, a commentary in Portuguese because uh, we also need to diversify the languages, uh, English and French and Spanish, I would say, are very dominant, but uh, uh, Portuguese is also a, a widely spoken language in the world, and we decided to do a, um, a, a commentary to the Vienna Convention on Diplomatic Relations um, in Portuguese. Um, and and um, it's very interesting to see how this, uh, and for me, it's uh, <laughs> the bestseller of the ILC because it's the, it's the project that we worked on uh, that became a treaty very quick and it has, it has universal ratification. So for me, it's the ILC's bestseller and, and very uncontested and also stood very well, I think, the test of time. Um, in the sense that even in situations that were not foreseen, like the question of epidemics, and I know there were a lot of tensions, uh, while well, the question speaks about the Ebola crisis, but now if, if we think about the COVID-19 uh, issues of uh, you know, quarantining diplomats or not allowing entrance into the country, um, but, but in the end, I think most issues were resolved, <laughs> probably through the political means uh, that Mamadou was um, uh, referring to, and, and I don't think this will end up as a legal dispute, but I, I, the, the Vienna Convention does have um, uh, the capacity to adapt to um, new circumstances. And, and of course, there are issues, and this is something that prompted us to do the, the commentaries, that this is something that states apply on a daily basis, and there's issues on a daily basis. And sometimes we highlight the, uh, a point that where uh, something didn't go right, but but again, um, it facilitates um, and uh, so much uh, the diplomatic interchanges um, on, on a daily basis. So I just wanted to make those points in reaction to the question. Thank you very much, Patricia. May I witness, uh, may I add some, some points that I, I participated in a panel discussing the relationship between asylum protection and uh, the question of uh, diplomatic uh, privileges and immunities of diplomatic missions and uh, of uh, uh, persons having that status, diplomats. And uh, I think the, the, the convention was, was considered as very, very much alive in the sense that it covered, it covered the, the, the full range of situations and so on with, with certain accents and points that are made by states when they face a problem and, and they are part of a crisis or a tension. Uh, if there is no, uh, further comment or, or uh, interest in participating, may I close uh, this panel by thanking the panelists who have been so uh, uh, grateful. I'm so grateful for participating in the panel. It is not an honor, not only an honor, but also a privilege because of the, the experience you transmit. You, all of you have different, uh, have had different experiences are looking at events from a different perspective, although uh, uh, to some extent very supplementary to each other. And I would like to say that uh, there are at least four subjects nowadays uh, which are calling for development of international law. Cyber operations, which is a major issue, not, all, no, not only in terms of security, in terms of services to the population, uh, the sociological, foundations of our society could be damaged by something which is completely out of control of uh, either states or uh, individuals. Second, the BBNJ, beyond national jurisdiction, that is a major issue in the law of the sea, uh, interrelated with other areas that you have already mentioned, intellectual property, scientific research, the question of, of uh, uh, control, access and control, the question of the adoption of protected areas and so on, that will be uh, a, to some extent a revolution in law if it is a successful conference as I expect it to be. Another area is the question of health, uh, public health and pandemics, 
there was the, the resolution passed by the Institute of Water National, which was facilitated, the promptness was facilitated by a, an a personal engagement of the rapporteur, other participants, and the goodwill of, of the members. Not always our institutions work in that direction, because sometimes individuals want to prevail over a collective uh, approach. But this was a very useful uh, tool. We will see what happens with the initiative to negotiate a treaty that will update the current uh, regulations, which are also binding. And other areas, not only the law of the sea, like civil level rights, the question of international criminal law. I think there are two initiatives that are running on a parallel basis, the question of uh, uh, adopting uh, the Convention on Crimes and, uh, and uh, collaboration uh, regarding uh, uh, the prevention and uh, sanctioning and so on, and the mutual legal assistance uh, uh, initiative. Uh, I think some clarifications may be needed in order to have a common approach towards the integration of the criminal law as, as such and procedures. And uh, most and foremost, the question of mutual legal assistance, because it is domestic jurisdiction that should be used in a certain direction. And then the international legal uh, setting will operate uh, in order to integrate more states into the initiatives. So with this, I thank you very much uh, for your time, participation, and, and thanks to those who uh, considered my name as uh, a, a chair or co-chair of, of this panel, because it has been a real honor to be with you. Have a nice Saturday evening.